Welcome to Brigades TV. This week we have Dr. Philip Bain from the University of Wisconsin, who's been a medical brigades doctor in both Honduras and Ghana. In the past few months, he's been developing a mobile technology that will allow you to identify abnormal pap smear results in the field. Dr. Philip Bain tells us a little bit about the technology and some of the challenges and interesting elements of this project he's been facing this past couple of weeks. Dr. Philip Bain on Brigades TV. I know this sounds kind of um, odd, but I woke up in the middle of the night when I got back from Ghana and um, I had dreamed the idea that, you know, I wonder why we couldn't do point of care cervical cancer testing. So I submitted the project to the University of Wisconsin Biomedical Engineering Program because they're always interested in um, um, methods to develop uh, new ways to do things better in uh, medicine. And so they accepted it uh, in the fall semester and I've been working uh, on a weekly basis with four very enthusiastic second and third year biomedical engineering students. And we've taken the project from concept to the point where we're now nearly able to field test it here in Madison. Wow, that's such an advancement. So you had the idea through experience in Honduras. From there, uh, you saw how we were doing the testing with the acetic acid in Ghana. I remember buying uh, vinegar for that project. So uh, things went well in Ghana, but still not entirely accurate and not exactly what we have uh, in terms of hospitals in the States. So you think that this idea and the abstract that you wrote with these Madison, Wisconsin students is going to be able to develop what type of technology? Well, in the United States and other developed countries, what generally happens when a woman uh, goes in to get her um, cervical cancer screening, uh, she has what uh, we call commonly a pap smear. And the um, cells from the cervical epithelium are taken on a... Um, with a spatula and put on a slide and then fixed. And then they're sent to a cytotechnology lab. And what really happens at a cytotechnology lab in general is um, they're first screened by a, a um, machine called an autopap. Um, and there are a number of different machines that do this, but they use an algorithmic approach to determining if the uh, smear is interpretable. And if it is uh, interpretable, then it does it represent a normal or not normal slide. And then not normal slides are passed on to the cytotechnologists who review them and send the worrisome slides on to a cytopathologist. So if even if we could develop a program that would mimic the automated screening process, we could really have a significant improvement in cervical cancer screening. Right on. So a lot of this stuff is really difficult to do in the field in rural countries. Uh, you know the technology that we're able to bring along when we do data informatics on a medical brigade. You know the hills of Honduras and you've seen what it's like uh, kind of in the rural parts of Ghana. So uh, how would you, you know, kind of create something that NGOs would be able to use given the conditions they have when, while working in the field without access to a lot of healthcare professionals, without access to hospitals and clinics? Right. Um, well, some of the criteria that we developed for a successful um, um, project is it has to be inexpensive, um, it has to be uh, reproducible, it has to be easy on the patients, it has to be accurate, and ideally it would be great to be able to be used by people that are in the community, such as a village health worker because we wanted something that could be used in uh, rural villages with minimal training. What we did is we uh, worked with the, the students in the program and we found a software program called ImageJ, which is in common usage on university campuses. And we developed uh, an, an algorithm whereby the program could be taught about the criteria that would allow a slide to be interpreted accurately, um, and then if it was interpretable, the, then um, did it have characteristics of a concerning uh, cervical smear or not? So um, the next big step that we have coming this semester, and I don't think it's going to be all that difficult of a hurdle, is we need to find out what is the minimum magnification necessary uh, for this um, uh, project. Uh, and so we're, we're working with uh, uh, folks at the biophotonics um, lab at UW 
to try to find out what magnification and resolution is necessary. And then we can build, hopefully, an inexpensive attachment um, for that uh, to be used. So um, that's not going to be a major hurdle, I think. Well, right on. What are the things that you need in order to get this to trial? What are the next steps in terms of getting this on a brigade or on any organization that wants to use, I guess, a pap smear application in the field? Well, um, right now, um, we're actually in a very good place to have this uh, developed because we have numerous contacts on campus and in the city of Madison that can help us um, test it and give us opinions on kind of where the bumps in the road might be. So what's next is, is that we need to go to the biophotonics lab and uh, try different ways to magnify the slide. And we're also working with a parallel group that's developing a smartphone or similar app to diagnose treatable anemias. And they've already worked through the magnification part. And what we did is we compared four different um, types of magnification. One, a research grade magnification device, a magnifying uh, uh, enlarging device, uh, research grade, $40,000. Uh, the next one was a hospital grade uh, uh, microscope. That's about anywhere from three to $10,000. The third one was a uh, almost what, what we refer to as a toy, something you could buy in a store like Best Buy and attach onto a smartphone. And then the fourth thing was uh, the most interesting to me, but the most uh, disappointing was we looked up on a do-it-yourself uh, website and somebody had uh, a do-it-yourself uh, method for um, making a, a smartphone uh, uh, microscope and it involved a one millimeter um, magnifying lens that you would um, put in a rubber shim after you put a darning needle through it, stretch the rub piece of rubber, put the um, uh, magnifying lens in there and then cut out around it and then fit it in your smartphone. It was very cool but the problem was uh, a one millimeter lens is about half the size of a period in a sentence and so uh, it was kind of comical because we were in the Union Memorial Union at UW all set with our, uh, our magnifying glass trying to see this and we had a little tweezers and then right as we were about ready to put it in one of the students kind of twitched and the magnifying lens is somewhere on, on the floor of the uh, Memorial Too Union. <laughs> Too small. Right on. So once, once, once we identify what is the minimum um, magnification and resolution needed to get an accurate uh, view of the, the uh, cervical uh, slide, then what we'll do is we'll take it to the biophotonic students and see if we can reproduce this um, inexpensively uh, so that we can do that. From there, what we'll do is we'll work very closely with the School of Cytotechnology at UW and work with them to review um, hundreds of slides that are already processed and use the cytotechnology students as the gold standard. And then once we can get a confidence uh, level adequate that this is going to be you know, reproducible, we'll uh, field test it hopefully on a, a brigades project. Well, yeah, that was going to be kind of my next question, Dr. Bain. It's such a cool process, and it's really awesome to hear kind of the journey you've gone from being on brigades, being a, you know, a physician back in Wisconsin, and then kind of bridging those two with technology. So then, then I guess kind of my last question was, you know, we work with a lot of students. What would be your recommendation for those that have a technology background but are still interested in medicine? Well, you know, a lot of these uh, biomedical engineering students will end up in medicine. Um, they they want to go to medical school. But um, that's one kind of uh, nuance that I didn't appreciate. Working with these students, they were very interested in projects like this. And uh, in developing countries, there is a tremendous amount of, of projects that could be done like this on a, uh, hopefully on an inexpensive um uh, basis that could be um, used in future brigades. So I think this opens up a whole new um, avenue of, of uh, or a whole new type of student that might want to go on a brigade. And uh, they were very interested in uh, field testing it themselves going on a brigade. So I think it's really exciting to see how, how something like, uh, something that's been done already for a number of years, a medical brigade, spawns an idea that 
can be taken back at home, percolated for a year or so, and then a solution that comes out and uh, that could easily be tested on future brigades. Right on. Well, hey, it is an absolute pleasure, as always, to get to hear from you and to give us an update of what you're up to. Uh, it's very much appreciated, and I know that anybody else that wants to get in touch with you will either see you on, on, a, on a medical brigade in Ghana in the near future or uh, be able to contact you at the University of Wisconsin. But Dr. Bain and Kat, it's uh, been a pleasure uh, getting a chance to talk to you, and thanks for introducing your project. Is there any chance that you could have, like, a global brigade for cats? Hey, man, I've been trying to get veterinary brigades for years. We'll see what we can do in the future. <laughs> Dr. Bain, thank you so much for doing uh, this Brigades TV piece. Appreciate it. Go Wisconsin. Go Badgers. And uh, we'll see you on a brigade soon. Okay. Excellent. Bye.